I have to say I am absolutely delighted to be able to introduce Maury Fox, who, of course, needs no introduction whatsoever. <laughs> now, I'm not going to promise that what I say is entirely accurate, but I'm sure that anything I say that's incorrect, uh, Maury will correct. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is, is just offer you some of my personal recollections and my understanding a little bit of, of Maury's history. So I was thinking about it when, when I was asked to give these comments. I met Maury 39 years ago, which is remarkable. Um, I was a senior here, and Maury was teaching 703. And I took the course. He was the one who introduced me to the field of genetics. Um, and he introduced me in particular to a classical textbook in genetics by Sternovit and Beadle which is phenomenal. If you haven't seen it, you should. I continue to use it as a reference, and uh, I don't know if there are any, there, there are no graduate students who haven't already taken the course, so I'm safe. I continue also to use it as a source of exam questions, because <laughs> it has just wonderful information in it. Um, Maury and 703 together had a very major impact on me, and, and I think it's fair to say I wouldn't be standing here without that combination. Uh, which really persuaded me um, of genetics uh, as an area of interest, and more generally persuaded me that biology was an area of interest. Not, not perhaps obvious from the fact that I was taking 703 as a senior. I was not a biology major. And this was pivotal in, in really moving me into, into this field. Uh, I must say that some years later, many years later, I had the privilege of teaching 703 with Maury. So I felt like that had come, in some sense, full circle. So a little history about Maury. And this is where I can't promise that I'm entirely accurate, but we'll try. Um, Maury received his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago. And I think it was in meteorology. Is that right? And then, <laughs> and then left the University of Chicago for a period of time because World War II intervened. And uh, Maury was in the military as a meteorologist. And my understanding is he was one of the first people to actually observe hurricanes using radar. So this was a very early application of radar. Radar, of course, was discovered, developed here, you know, mere feet away in, in the building that we still refer to, some of us, as Building 20, which is uh, no longer with us for the status center. After that, Maury returned to the University of Chicago. He did his PhD studies in chemistry. And those were with Willard Libby. And Libby was the inventor of radiocarbon dating. So again, very much at the cutting edge of very, very pivotal discoveries. And it was there at the University of Chicago that Maury met Leo Zillard, um, who became his longtime friend, and I think it would be fair to say mentor in, in many respects. And Zillard, um, I know many people know who Zillard was. Um, Zillard was a physicist who, at the time when many physicists were moving into molecular biology and actually creating the field of molecular biology, Zillard made that transition, I would say, in some unusual ways. And he was pivotal intellectually, both in the development of the field and uh, also in the notion of the interface between science and policy, as he was very influential in uh, advocating for world peace. And, and I think, and again, Maury will tell me if I've got this one right, I think he drafted the letter from Einstein to Roosevelt that, that Einstein signed. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Zillard had a, a very major influence in, in, in many letters. ways. Yeah. <laughs> There were two letters. Two letters. Yeah. Yeah. This I didn't know. Um, so this led Maury to become a molecular biologist. He moved from Chicago to Rockefeller, where uh, he was on the faculty. He worked closely with Roland Hotchkiss, another classic figure in, uh, in the history of molecular biology. And Maury then came here to MIT in 1962. I think as a consequence of efforts by Gene and Boris. Is that 
fair to say? The Cy Leventhal. The Cy Okay. There are several people who have had a hand in it. Many, many people were involved. Okay. So, so here at MIT, Maury has had, I think it's fair to say, countless major impacts. Um, his research, which, uh, as everybody I'm sure knows, concerns fundamental mechanisms of mutation and recombination, uh, has been truly landmark. He's played a major uh, intellectual role in a variety of other fields, including, I, I think, uh, if, I don't know how many people I may offend by this statement, uh, imparting critical thinking from biology to medicine in certain areas, particularly uh, with involvements in breast cancer. Um, Maury was a central figure with the Consul for a Livable World, and he worked very hard in the area of nuclear disarmament, and I'm, I'm assuming and hoping we'll hear a little bit about that from him today. Uh, in the department, um, he revolutionized the teaching of, of genetics, and he was responsible for introducing the course that today we know is 750, and, and we know is really a pivotal component of the training of graduate students. And Maury was department head from 1985 to 1989. These are details. I think much more fundamentally, uh, Maury's knowledge, uh, insight, and, and the word I always associate with Maury is wisdom, um, have really helped drive, I would say, all of the good things that have happened here for as many years as, as since I joined the department. There are many anecdotes I can think about, but I'm not going to take all of Maury's times this morning, uh, time this morning. One thing that comes to mind is when he was given a named chair. Uh, and there are two aspects of this that I, I remember particularly. First of all, the chair was the Lef Lester Wolf Professorship. And it always struck a number of us that making a fox the wolf professor <laughs> had, had interest, and I never knew if that was actually done with, with that goal in mind. The, the other thing about that chair, and, and this one I'm again not sure I remember entirely, is that it caused Maury to explain to me on one occasion the difference between wet chairs and dry chairs. Okay, wet chairs come with money. Maury's chair was a dry chair. <laughs> it came with honor. <laughs> um, a few personal comments. First, I have to say personally that he and his wife Sally, who, who passed away a year ago, have been very special to me, strong supporters, good friends, and I know good friends to many of the people who have been in this room. Uh, their interests have been very broad, very stimulating. Sally was uh, accomplished in the field of the history of art, and together they were great collectors uh, of primitive art in particular. Um, I must say I watched their boys grow up, uh, one of whom is sitting right over here, and there were various memorable events. Uh, just thinking about Michael, we won't go into the mail delivery time, but. <laughs> But the, the, the event that was perhaps most memorable to me was part A of the snake. Okay. When, when Michael's snake, big snake, was lost apparently in the area of the great court just before MIT's graduation, <laughs> there was a substantial hunt for the snake that had to be carried out. Um, the snake was never found. And again, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that at the end of that hunt, MIT sent Maury a bill <laughs> for, for, the, uh, for the snake hunt. Okay, so I've, I've really gone on long enough. Let me just finish by saying Maury is a very special person and, and also a very special friend. He has always been passionate about science and about life. His views are marked by a broad and deep knowledge um, absolute honesty, complete independence of mind, humility, wisdom, and a driving desire to promote what really is best for humanity. I always look forward to hearing Maury's perspectives, uh, his opinions, and his wisdom. And I just want to say I think we are all lucky to be here today to hear what he has to say. So, Maury, it's all yours.
That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> I guess one of the things that I thought that might be useful to talk about is a sort of the beginning of my career. Uh, because it's an example of having had difficulty making a decision difficulty in my own head and difficulty in the world around me. I mean, I started in college with the notion of going into chemistry. I was passionate about chemistry. I had earlier on been interested in archaeology, but chemistry was my passion. And the Second World War interfered with that. And I enlisted in probably 1942, December, something like that. Uh, and I enlisted with the intent of trying to get into a program that I learned about called the Program of Meteorology. Uh, a, a Swedish meteorologist had decided that in the Second World War, there would be a need to be able to predict the weather because aircraft were being used prominently. And uh, I got into that program. I got into that program. I'd been in college for a year and a half or something like that. And by the time I was finished with that program, I had enough credits at the University of Chicago to get a degree with a major in meteorology. So I became a meteorologist. And I forecast the weather for two and a half years. And during that time, I thought about what was I going to do when this was all over? Golly. And for a long time, I thought about going into medicine as an obvious pathway to I guess doing good. And, but I couldn't. I couldn't go into medicine with any reliability because medicine would require that I go to six years or seven years or eight years of university. And I didn't have the money to do that. I knew that the GI Bill existed, but that was a limited resource. And so I had to reject that. <coughs> and I did. And so I took a second alternative, going back to chemistry and going into nuclear chemistry with the notion of, uh, look, I was 22 years old. What was I going to do? Provide energy for everybody. That was, that was my passion. And I went back and took undergraduate chemistry at Queens College. At the same time, I was teaching in chemistry because I had a bachelor's degree in meteorology, but I was teaching chemistry. And then I applied for the University of Chicago, and I got in the graduate program in chemistry and went to work with Willard Libby. Uh, I did a thesis, and by the time I was finished, I knew that I was not going to go into chemistry. <laughs> no, I, but I finished it. I knew that that was not the area that I had dreamt about. It just wasn't. Uh, Libby was not at all sympathetic, and I went searching for another alternative. I mean, I actually searched. I tried to get, I tried to inquire at the University of Chicago about going to medical school again. And everybody told me I would have to go back to university to take biochemistry and genetics 
and things like that. And I didn't have the resources to do that anymore. It was just not an option. And so I started screening bulletin boards to, for opportunities. And there was an announcement of a seminar by Aaron Novick on mutations in steady state for bacteria. And I went to the seminar. The seminar was so exciting. It was an area of endeavor that really turned me on. And it had all of the elements that I found exciting about chemistry. I was passionate about kinetics. That was my turn on. And here was the kinetics of making mutants. So I went to talk to Aaron briefly afterwards. And he said, well, we have a paper. If you want to read it, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. And he gave me a copy of the paper. And I read it. And a couple of days later, I called him and said, I'd like to talk to you about it. And within, I don't know, three days or four days, he stopped by the lab. And we talked about it. He said, Zillard would like to talk to you. Now, who is Leo Zillard? He was the man who discovered the chemical reaction that I used to do my thesis. My thesis was on the zillard chalmers reaction. At that time, it was called hot atom chemistry, but <laughs> never mind that. <laughs> and it's the largest history. He was the man who conceived of the chain reaction. He was the man who conceived the connection, maybe not the only one, but conceived the connection between entropy and information. The beginning of computers, 1920, it was his thesis. He was concerned with Maxwell's demon, the creature that separates fast atoms from slow atoms. Well, I went to lunch with him. And there were two other people at lunch. There was a postdoc in Harold Urey's lab. And there was Aaron Novick. And Zillard started quizzing us. You know, why did we want to go into biology? Things like that. I had the foggiest notion why I wanted to go into biology. I felt like it was the right thing to do. And he kept pushing it. The postdoc knew exactly what he wanted to do. He was a spectroscopist. And he was interested in the characteristics of the spectra of polycyclic aromatics that made them carcinogenic. And that's what he wanted to work on. I felt a little bit stupid, but that's the way it was. That afternoon, Zillard called me and asked me, invited me to join his lab. It was terrific. He didn't have any money, but he was going to get the money. And I had confidence in that. Whether it was justified or not is another matter, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's how it started. I mean, I came to his lab at the University of Chicago. The original lab was in the basement of a synagogue, I think, across the midway from the main campus. But at the time I joined it, it was in the new molecular bio, a new building of, of bridges between different departments. And uh, that's how I got started. And I started working on the chemistat. And it was an exciting time. And I spent two years learning biology. Novick and Zillard sent me to a genetics course. I didn't understand one word. <laughs> I really did not understand it. 
uh, and they kept saying how terrific this course was. Uh, but it happened. I mean, he sent me to Cold Spring Harbor for a summer to take the phage course, and the bacterial genetics course, which I later taught. And the following summer, he sent me to Cold Spring Harbor, I'm sorry, to Pacific Grove, where I took a course with C.B. Van Neel, who is a Dutch microbiologist trained by Beirink, who it was a terrific course. We met three days a week, three days all day. And it was a mixture of lectures and lab. And Van Neel loved the idea of choosing one of the students in the course, and there were 20 odd students, to nail. <laughs> and he would walk around during the lab part of the course listening to what people were saying. <laughs> and he would pick something up and he would bring it to the front. It was a terrific course. And it lasted for 10 weeks. 10 weeks he gave 10 times 3, 30 lectures all day, every day, all day, every other day. Did he ever nail you? Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. But he gave me a book once, Brave New World. I mean, we were talking about something, and he said, you've got to read this book. And he, he went home, got it out of his library, and brought it to me to read. It was a terrific book. But that's, that's the way he was. He was fantastic. Uh, you know, he comes from a tradition. Byrick was also fantastic. There was one occasion uh, during that summer, I, I had the idea of feeding the masses, feeding the people. And the idea was we should find a creature that chewed on sawdust and made fatty acids that you could grow yeast on, and the yeast could provide a food. And I thought that could be an interesting project. I mean, it was a time when I was interested in algae and things like, but there was a woman working for Van Neel as a postdoc, Mary Bell Allen, who was interested in thermophiles. So the idea was to find an organism that grew at high temperature and would chew up sawdust. So I went out and I found a pile of sawdust <laughs> in, uh, in, at Pacific Grove and I made flasks and I got soil and, and I sterilized everything and put the soil in, I'm sorry, got soil and I put the soil into sterile sawdust and put them at a, uh, incubator that Mary Lou had that was running at 60 degrees centigrade and started trying to do this. And I was doing that one day. I was looking at the cultures. And Van Neel came in, talked to Mary Lou. And, uh, and he saw me puttering. I, I don't know what I was doing, but he, said, she, he asked Mary Lou, what's he doing? And Mary Lou said to him, he's interested in commercial applications. <laughs> And he's interested in growing bacteria at high temperatures on sawdust. And Van Neel turned to me and started scowling. <laughs> and then he turned around and he walked slowly out of the room. It turned out that the night before, I had been reading his thesis from Holland. And his thesis was on propionic acid bacteria and Swiss cheese. And as he walked out of the room, I said, it seems to me I remember a thesis <laughs> from Holland about Swiss cheese. <laughs> and 
He shrunk <laughs> and left the room. <laughs> I got a fan club here. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to try to answer questions. I mean, I, I could talk on and on, but <laughs> not very useful. I mean, I think people are more interested here in this department. And that's another story. I mean, it's an additional story. But I came here with never having taken a course in genetics. I had not taken any undergraduate or graduate courses in biology. I'd taken Van Niel's course on microbiology and the phage course, bacterial genetics course, but no formal course in genetics. And MIT opted to hire me, and that was probably Cy Leventhal and other people who were responsible for that. It was at the beginning of the time when I think that Cy Leventhal was creating a new department in a place that had gone stagnant with regard to the contemporary biology that was emerging from the 50s. But I'll, I'll throw the thing out to you guys. Everybody's been quiet. Maury, uh, looking back, would you say that Chicago provided you with a wonderful environment for someone free thinking person like you? It did. Uh, I don't know how much of it I have to. I mean, Chicago is a very unusual place at that time. Uh, Hutchins was the president. And somebody had suggested to Hutchins, I don't know who, that the atomic bomb project was being dispersed. And that this was an opportunity to gather up very talented people. And he did. I mean, he brought Fermi, and he brought Yuri, and he brought Libby, and he brought Szilard, he brought, and others. And they all came to the University of Chicago. University of Chicago was a. What year was that? In the late 40s. But Fermi was there earlier. They did the uh, chain reaction on the stadium and so forth. That wasn't. Fermi was at Columbia when he did his earlier experiments, which didn't work, incidentally. But, but didn't something happen in Chicago? Yes, there was a stag field, but that was a, a military project. I mean, the people who were there were not necessarily faculty members at the University of Chicago. Morning. You're, uh, how did you get to Rockefeller? And how long did you stay there? Why did you decide to come here to Rockville? <clears throat> OK. Uh, I, I, got, I went to Rockefeller in, I guess, 54, 53, 54. Uh, I, when I went for, to Colesbury Harbor for the courses, I met Roland Hotchkiss. Roland Hotchkiss had a little cubbyhole of a laboratory in the building where the course was being, being given. And I used to kibitz with him, because he was interested in. And I introduced him to moving glass around with a Bunsen burner, making structures that he could use in the laboratory. And he was quite taken with that. <laughs> uh, and we talked about what he was doing. And a year later, he offered me a job at Rockefeller. He was about to be launched as a full member, and he could put together a department. I was the first appointment he could make. And what was your title? I don't know, something lower than, than, a, than an assistant professor. I, I know the Rockefeller system at that time. It was sort, sort of like the German system. Yeah, it was pretty, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, what was the other question you asked? How, did, how long did you stay and what? I was at Rockefeller for nine years. 
and what made you decide to come here? Well, because Rockefeller was a going concern. Yes, Rockefeller was a fantastic place. For most of the time I was there, one never had to apply for money. They worked off their endowment. Uh, and I gave up my laboratory when I decided I didn't want to hustle for money anymore. But, but th during the time I was there, Detlev Bronk came, became head of Rockefeller. And he had an, an imaginative idea of making Rockefeller into a graduate university for biology. Maybe more for more than biology, but in any case, that was the idea. And the program was terrific. It was generous, it was rich, uh, and it was exciting. About two or three years into the program, uh, some people, I believe, like Alfred Mirsky and there were a few other people, uh, prevailed on Bronk to change the program and change the program in a way that permitted the students contact with a lot of older biologists. Not as old as I am, but still pretty old. Uh, and my contact with the students, and I didn't realize this until a few years later, disappeared. I was closer to the students than I was to the faculty at Rockefeller. And all of a sudden, I was not meeting any of the new students. And I then figured it out afterwards. But, and I decided that Brock had abandoned the idea of a rich graduate program. And I decided I was going to leave. Yeah, Maureen, listening to your story, I'm wondering about the, the extrapolation to today. So post-PhD, where you had background in meteorology and chemistry, you didn't know what to do next, and yet you were able to end up in an environment which gave you time to explore and ultimately to, to set off in a brand new trajectory. My sense is that today that would not be so, so easy. Many people do something for a PhD and continue more or less straight and narrow in areas that are very similar to what they've done before. Uh, an operative word today is interdisciplinary, but usually when that is used, it means somebody doing something that applies that specific knowledge to another area, such as biology as opposed to really transitioning in a brand new way. Some people today, more than some years ago, will go, for example, from a PhD in this department to other areas, uh, but there are other areas like law or something in business where what they're really drawing upon is the expertise that they've had rather than starting over. And it seems like there's no time to start over. Things are too intense, things are too competitive. And I'd be interested to know your thoughts about these kinds of issues, and in particular, what you can say to people who, who are you know, at the stage you were at then, or about to be at that stage. Um, how, how can they attempt in today's environment to define, let alone follow, dreams? That's not an easy one. No, that's why I asked. <laughs> I don't know. I don't either. I, I wanted to tell you the story because it was a reality for me. And I suspect parts of it are a reality for you today, if you want to do it. I, one thing that was important to me was not important to me, for, important for me was that I didn't worry about what my future would entail. I mean, look, I was living at a time when it was the McCarthy era. 
and I had been heavily involved in activities before that with regard to opening a second front in Europe, uh, and that was a leftist idea. Many people thought it served the Russians. Never mind that it served the Russians. It was an important, I thought it was an important thing to do. And the question is, the people I was associated with were often leftists. And I, I had to worry about the question of whether McCarthy, when he came to Chicago, and he did, was going to call me. What was I going to do? Was I going to betray my associates? That's the way I viewed it. Or was I going to do something else? Not chemistry, not biology, be a short order cook. In my growing up, I'd spent nine years working in a delicatessen store every Saturday and Sunday, every holiday. That was, that was my father's occupation, and that's what I, I helped in the store. And I went to university. But so I could be a short order cook. But that's literally what I decided to, that I would be comfortable doing. It never came to that. But it was a fallback position. But that is into politics. The other part was that I didn't worry about, I didn't worry, I worried about money, but I didn't worry about what I was going to earn. I worried about whether I had resources to do this or that or something else. But I didn't worry about making a living. I just didn't. I don't know why. <laughs> and when I went into to work with Zillard, what was I getting? Eleven hundred dollars a year, something well like that. Paid. Huh? Well paid. <laughs> yeah. No, it was it was it was it was a very modest income. It was enough to live on. But I didn't worry about whether I had a career there. Because, you know, there were six laboratories in the United States that were interested in the kinds of things that we were talking about. I mean, there was Indiana and Urbana and Madison and University of Chicago. Cy Leventhal was in Michigan. He was in a physics department working on phage. Uh, there were all people like that. Maybe it was a gamble. I don't know whether it was a gamble or not. I don't think it was. But biology had become stagnant. And there were a few people who were interested in trying to identify what they thought were fundamental questions. And, you know, what was the material basis of heredity? The evidence for it was already around. It was from 1940s. But most people didn't believe it. But there were physicists who believed it. Murray Gell-Mann, when I told him I was going to work on transformation, was all excited about it. And he told me his views about it. He was at Chicago then. But, but that, that was, it was an idea. It was an idea that was remote from observations. How do you, I mean, you know, in the textbooks, they all tell you that Hershey and Chase proved that DNA was genetic material. It's not true. Hershey never claimed it. But Gunther Stead claimed it. <laughs> uh, no, it's, 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 it's important to think about these things and to look at the evidence.
Well, you see, to go out at art when so many people, it's not really have to do with you that you go out at the Hershey Chase experiment. So I just want to point out what the truth of it is. Eloria had previously shown that genetics is carried by phage, by mutating phage, and then showing that the particular characteristic of the phage were then reproduced in the field. Then Hershey Chase showed that only the DNA went in. And that, together with Luria's early observation, proved it was genetic material. But if you just talk about the Hershey Chase experiment without quoting Luria, it doesn't prove it, because the, material, the information could have been in the bacteria. And all that the DNA did was trigger it. So the important thing is, Keep, it in, keep in mind the connection. On the other hand, bacterial transformation really proved it. in one experiment, because you just use DNA, you could show that the subsequent generations could produce the DNA and have Let's not forget pneumotacus group of Rockefeller. Avery. Yeah, yeah. 1944. Can, can you, Murray, talk about uh, some of those early experiments that you did uh, about transformation? And what, what questions were you addressing? Uh, uh, that was interesting. When Rollin invited me to come to New York, I agreed to come. Uh, Leonard Lerman was a postdoc at Chicago at the same time I was there. I didn't get to know him very well at Chicago, but he was nominally under the tutelage of, of Leo Szilard also, although he, he didn't interact very much. I didn't interact with him, okay? Or he didn't interact with me. But at the same time that I came to New York, he was going to Colorado. And we met in New York. I think he was there for several weeks. We spent a lot of time together. And we mapped out the field of, I, I hadn't worked in this area, but we mapped out the field of the kinds of questions we would like to ask about DNA interacting with bacteria to make new combinations. And it was fantastic. It was a, exciting and and, and, uh, and we did all those experiments independently. I mean, we talked about them, but we did each of, you know, the first thing that we thought about was doing the stoichiometry. How many people understand that word? <laughs> it's an old word from chemistry. How much DNA do bacteria have to take up in order to be transformed. And it turns out that the number comes out to be close to one bacterial equivalent of DNA being taken up per transformant. In some ways, that may be a more powerful way than trying to prove that the active material is DNA and not small, some small protein contaminant of the DNA which Rollin was very active in trying to demonstrate. But he realized that it was an elusive target because Avogadro's number is so big. <laughs> but he tried, and he showed that the upper limit was very, very small of what protein a protein, but that's, and we did lots of, we agreed to lots of other experiments and we did them all. And we did others as well, but that was really very exciting. Yeah. You've mentioned a lot of your uh, teachers and mentors, and I was wondering if you could reflect on what you think are some of the best qualities of a great teacher and how you maybe developed as a teacher and what sort of advice you would give to someone starting in that path. I, I 
I'm not sure I can answer that question. I don't know what it takes to make a great teacher. I mean, I, I think probably the most important person teaching me was the Lord. And I don't know whether that was because he took me to lunch three times a week at the faculty club or because, <laughs> uh, or because uh, he spent his mornings in a bathtub thinking about science. <laughs> I mean, that, he was that kind of person. But he was a terrific thermodynamicist. He knew thermodynamics in a way that I don't. But but he would reduce everything to making a calculation to see whether it made sense for some things. And for others, it was a matter of logic. But he thought about things that were, he thought about problems that you could imagine, that you could work on, that allowed a possible resolution in terms of understanding what makes them work. That's the ultimate issue. What is a yesable proposition? And sometimes that's hard to do. Lots of times it's hard to do. <coughs> but that's what he did. And he listened to you tell you tell him about the experiments and he would try to poke holes in it. He, that was his passion. He liked jokes, too. I mean. <laughs> the Lord, to get back for a moment to the ability at the beginning of your career to change directions, uh, when did you have your first kid? <laughs> hey, you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably in 50, was it 50, <laughs> 50, 57. Yeah. It was after I'd, uh, actually, it was after I'd married a second time. Uh, it, that could have something to do with it. I wasn't married at the time that I started a graduate program but I did get married while I was in the graduate program in chemistry. I don't know what the bearing is, what bearing that has on what. No, I know, I understand it. Yeah. Um, could you maybe say a little something about Psi Leventhal? Because I suspect a fair number of people here don't know much about him, and he's not here to. And also funny. Huh? So funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cy Leventhal was, <laughs> was trained as a physicist. He was in the Navy. Uh, he had a faculty position at the University of Michigan. And I met him early in my career in the large lab. It was at a time when we used to assemble the people interested in what became molecular biology, but it wasn't called that. Uh, we would all get together in Ann Arbor or someplace else and talk about it, it, people from six or eight different institutions. Uh, and uh, I, I came to like Psy a lot. And, I don't know what set it off, but, but there was a point at which, since I was looking at mutations, and I knew that if you shined ultraviolet light on the growth, growing culture, on the continuously growing culture, you increase the mutation rate. It occurred to me that you could learn something about the target for particular mutations by looking at the action spectrum at different wavelengths of ultraviolet light. So 
to measure the spectrum of the active component of the light. And so that meant building a monochromator, a, a device that will give you light of a particular wavelength and looking at the mutation rates, OK? Um, and I got excited about that as, as a, an original experiment in 1951, I guess, 52. Uh, and at the next meeting at Ann Arbor, I ran into Sy and I told him about this experiment. He said, oh, he said, terrific. I had an idea similar to that. He said, would you like a monochromator? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he'd gone through the, the part of building the monochromator, and he was offering it to me. But he'd obviously had the same idea and decided that it was a fruitless objective. <laughs> but he was willing to share his, his assets. Uh, but uh, he, he was a very imaginative biologist who loved to teach a new course. I mean, he, he came to MIT. I don't know how Sizer knew Cy Leventhal. But Sizer was appointed chairman of biology at MIT, as I understand it, uh, at the point when the visiting committee had come to MIT and looked at biology and decided it was a basket case. Not all the biochemists agreed with that, but that's what they decided. Uh, and Sizer called Sy in Michigan and offered him a position, a chair in biology here at MIT. And Sy came. That was 58, I guess. Uh, and Sai taught 701. He taught, I think he taught the embryology course at one point. He taught all kinds of courses. And he, he chose to, to teach courses as a way to learn the material. But the, the, apparently, probably the most influential course that he taught was the method and logic course. He used to teach a course for graduate students that met one evening a week over in building 16 in the, what's this, Loofboro Lounge? Loofboro yeah. Lounge. And that was full of people from all over the Boston area. Everybody came. And it was a, not a lecture course. It was a discussion. It was a discussion in which everybody participated. And the issues that were being raised was, how did so-and-so prove that this was true? And what are the reservations? And how would you go about resolving those reservations? I mean, it was an analytical course. It was the course that became our method and logic course for graduate students. But it's no longer a course for everybody in the Boston area. Is, although I think people from, I think there was an active discouragement of, of taking students from outside. But I'm not talking about students. I'm talking about the faculty members. Everybody came. It, it was, nothing else was being offered anywhere of this sort. And Cy and I took that recipe and took it to Verena in Italy. And we taught a course for a summer in biology for physicists. And I took the course and offered a course, organized a course in India in the late 60s uh, of the same sort. There was an Indian, and well, there were first two Indians, but then it reduced to one. And then there were three uh, Americans. 
uh, George Streisinger, Marty Gellert, and I. Huh? Obed. Obed. And Obed was the Indian. I mean, that, that's how things started then. I mean, how did Obed end up? And Obed Siddiqui came to my lab here in Boston, in Cambridge. He, he was a terrific biologist. He still is. I mean, he's working on taste and smell in Drosophila. Has been for many years. But he'd taken his degree with Pontecorvo in genetics, and he came here to work with Al Guerin, who for a while, was, for a number of years, was working on the coding problem. And Obed wanted to go back to India. And he came up, he was up in New York at one point, and we were together. We, We matched. I mean, it was just a close friendship for many, many years. But that was the beginning. And uh, we talked one afternoon about the issue of he wanted to go back to India. What could he do? We talked about it. And I said, look, if you want to go back to India, you should go back to a physics department. The biologists will kill you because they're not interested in this kind of biology. You're interested in natural history. So if you want to go, into, go back to India, you should go to a physics department. The physicists will be interested in what you're doing. They'll leave you alone. <laughs> no, it's true. And so he said, how can I do that? I'm a biologist. And I said, well, look, there, there is a great Indian physicist named Homi Baba. And I know somebody who knows Homi Baba. <laughs> no, Homi Baba, he knew, Szilard knew Homi Baba in Cambridge, England. And I remembered that. And so I said, I'm willing to call Szilard to ask him to get in touch with Homi Baba. He said, would you? I said, OK. So I phoned Szilard in Washington. And in three weeks, Obed had a letter from Homi Baba inviting him to join the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in Bombay. And Homi Baba created a biology section in the Tata Institute. It was the first. And that's how it started. Then Obed came to, to Boston, and I raised money to support him while he was here. Not very much. Uh, and it was terrific. And that's where he made the transition. He came here, worked with me for a year, and then he worked with Seymour Benzer for a year. And that's where he changed to Drosophila, worked on Drosophila, and started his interest in, in taste and smell. We have probably time for one more question. Anyone else does? Maury, I'd be interested in going back to the start in the Solar Lab. You mentioned that you were working with the chemistat, which I know for a fact many of the people, uh, younger people in the department, have no clue what it was. And I'm interested if you sort of take give, me, give you an overview. Take, take you from there to bacterial transformation where you found out. You should repeat your seminar you gave a couple of years ago. <laughs> the chemistat was a device that Szilard created, Szilard and Novik created, for growing bacteria under conditions that are constant. And so the bacteria can grow for many, many generations, hundreds of generations. And it's a, 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 an interesting device for studying evolution. <laughs> uh, but I, 
that they had nothing to do with each other. It was my it was my bridge for getting into biology, and uh, Roland Hotchkiss thought I would be an interesting colleague. And uh, so we may have time for this. one more question back here. I'm just interested to know what you think, uh, maybe of all the great questions you were first asking 50 years ago, what what one question is left that you think is the most interesting? <laughs> could, you, could you start elaborating? I think that it's important, important, that people ought to raise the issue, deal with the issue, of what are the important questions today? What are the, what's the mission of biology? And the mission of biology 50 years ago or more was very, very different. And there are lots of missions that you can imagine having to do with development and having to do with disease and things like that. But to focus attention on questions that are yesable propositions, questions that there's, that we have the wherewithal to think about answering. There are lots of questions you can raise that, that we don't have the wherewithal to answer. But it's important to think about that. And it's, it's my impression that people are not focusing attention on that. They, they see biology as a, a branch of the medical profession, biology having to do with human health. And it does have something to do with human health. But I think fundamental questions of biology are sort of getting lost in terms of, of thinking about it. I, that's, that's the impression I have, OK? But I don't think that, I think there are fundamental questions. But I think the question is, the issue is, what have people gotten together and asked the, ask the question, what are the fundamental questions today? And I, I get, when I raise that issue, I get answers like uh, AIDS and cancer. cancer and things like that. I think cancer is a fundamental question, but it's not it's not the same kind of fundamental question as how is the lineage established? How, what are the, the, the elements that carry the information from one generation to the next? What are the, how, how is that information transferred to an organism? Things like, those are all questions we've, we, gotten the idea of how that works, some of it, but I, I, I still think that there, that the, the, the mission of biology does not seem to me to be clear in the minds of people who are currently operating. 